Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to another Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club Tuesday night lecture and uh, thanks for joining us. If you're watching us uh, on the YouTube, you're more than welcome, but please do hit that like and subscribe button if you don't already. The Tuesday night lecture series started uh, almost feels like ages ago, months ago, months ago back in April. Uh, back in April or early May, it actually was. And um, it started off just as an idea during the lockdown. Wouldn't it be great to have uh, a bit of a discussion series on Tuesday nights about many different topics of amateur radio that no one has any clue about? And um, we're great to be joined by the person again who started off the very first one. And uh, that was Dom M0 uh, BLF. Dom, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Uh, very well, thank you. Yes, uh, good to be back, and uh, thanks for inviting me back as well. Yeah, it, it's great uh, Great to have you back, Dom. Um, Dom, uh, obviously, you took our first one on uh, satellites and working or the QO100 station uh, in particular, yep. um, or in particular, and uh, you're going to be kicking us off uh, this evening uh, with a different topic. So uh, maybe just... For those that don't know you, maybe we introduction and uh, over to you then. Cool. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, um, so uh, thanks everyone again. Um, I'm Dom M0BLF, uh, been licensed 25 years this month, apparently. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while I've been in the hobby um, and uh, it's, it's sort of become a big part of my life, actually. Work, work, in, work and live in Cambridge, uh, work in the software industry uh, here. Um, and uh, but uh, but really enjoy a lot of amateur radio things, amongst which the expeditions. So we're at the other end of the spectrum, if you like, from uh, from Q100 uh, this time. Uh, Q100 up at up at uh, three sems. Uh, this time we're we're purely down on the HF bands uh, going on on the expeditions. So uh, I will uh, share my screen at that point, and uh, I think it's going to be on that one. I think. And hopefully that's uh, shared the right one, or has it shared the wrong one? I think it's shared the wrong one, actually. Uh, I can't see. I shared the right one. How to go on a de-expedition? Yeah, we've got that full screen. Yeah, yeah. You have. Fantastic. Okay. So the dual, dual monitors here, I couldn't quite tell which one it was sharing. Cool. Okay. So, um, yeah. So this is uh, how to go on de-expedition. Uh, and you've got me there on, on the left and uh, Dan M0WUT on in the middle, and uh, Rob M0VFC, who is Terry's son, um, on, on the right there. Um, and we'll come back to that photo a little later on. So a little bit about uh, my, my history doing the expeditions. My first expedition was actually 20 years ago. I uh, had the opportunity to go on an iota de expedition along the St. Lawrence Passage in Canada and visiting all the little islands along there, which was a really fascinating trip. And uh, since then, um, that been to a number of different places. Amongst the more recent, um, more exotic or interesting trips, uh, been to uh, Foxtrot Papa, so Saint Pierre Miquelon, which is a tiny little French archipelago just off the coast of Newfoundland. It's kind of like the bit of Quebec that France didn't give back. Uh, it is still French territory, and uh, sitting out there in the in the Atlantic. So I've been there. I've also been to Ascension Island uh, in the middle of the of the Atlantic, sort of out on the equator. And uh, you'll actually see a photo of Terry there in the middle. And uh, we'll come back to that trip a little later on. Um, Bermuda, VP9, uh, fascinating, fascinating place. And uh, rather colder, Svalbard, uh, Juliet Whiskey. And then in the last couple of years, so end of 2018, um, went to, to VP2M, which is a Montserrat in the Caribbean, which again we'll come back to in, in slightly more detail. And then uh, about a year ago, in fact January 2020, um, before the, all the COVID stuff happened, had the fortune to go out to ZC4, uh, the, um, the UK sovereign base area in Cyprus. So a lot of these call signs you'll have just seen flash past uh, ends in UW, uh, that's a reference to G60W, the Cambridge University Wireless Society, uh, which I'm a member of. And, and we kind of organise a lot of the trips through them. 
uh, as well as also through CAMHAMS, which is a, a, a more informal group um, associated to Cambridgeshire Repeater Group. So that's uh, kind of a few of the places I've been to uh, in, in recent years. Uh, so you're very fortunate to get that opportunity to, to do a fair amount of traveling. So why do we go on the expeditions? Um, well, it's, it's really about giving people back home exciting contacts. You know, that, that's, that's why we do it. Um, lots of people want to tick off all the countries for DXCC or all the islands for IOTA. Fine. There's also lots and lots of people who just want to be able to say, hey, I spoke to this rare place uh, today and the sort of place you wouldn't normally hear about on the news, perhaps. For, for us as the expeditioners, it's a great excuse to travel, though. Um, I really, really enjoy traveling, going to going to different places. And, um, you know, as, as, as a de-expeditioner, it's, it's kind of a good excuse. Not many hobbies give you a reason to go to obscure places like Montserrat or Ascension or Svalbard. Um, and Amateur Radio certainly does that. So, so it's great from that point of view. And also you get to experience the sharp end of pileups. Um, you know, it's really quite something being, being at the end of a pileup. And I'll give you a little snippet of, of audio a little later on as well for that. So um, in terms of if you want to go on the expedition, I'd, I'd kind of recommend starting small. And uh, Lawrence didn't know he was going to be seeing a photo of himself this evening, but uh, I didn't know who's going to be here either. So uh, there you are, Lawrence. Uh, that is um, one of the Cam Hams trips. Each, uh, each year, we will typically, around May, obviously not last year and probably not this year, um, we'll typically go off to somewhere, perhaps the, the Inner Hebrides last, uh, in 2019, it was the Isle of Man, somewhere like that. Uh, to to operate and anywhere sort of between about eight and 14 of us will uh, will take over a a large cottage or something for a week and uh, and take a load of radio equipment with you and you know it get, gets you used to operating in in a group in a um in a multi-station environment having to deal with qrm between between stations and uh, and putting up temporary antennas and, and all that sort of stuff and it's, it's really great activity for a club uh, if you if you're an active club i'd, I'd certainly recommend doing something like that. But um, at the end of the day, even though it's good practice, somewhere like the Inner Hebrides is, is perhaps not the most interesting place in the world. So then we come on to the question of why do places get rare? Why, why is, it, is it that uh, there are difficult places in amateur radio? And there can be a number of reasons, right? Uh, so it can just be this time consuming to go to. Um, Rob, M0VFC, uh, Terry's son again, um, spent uh, some time on Tristan Dacuna a few years ago. Uh, that is literally mid-Atlantic um, in the most remote island in the world. It took him 10 days on the cargo ship there and 11 days on the cargo ship coming back again. Uh, you know, at that sort of point, you're, you're talking about a month off work to be able to go on, on a de-expedition. So there's some places that are just time consuming, even if they're otherwise entirely possible to do. Other places can be difficult to get to. Um, I'm thinking perhaps uh, of... Uh, um, some of the nature reserves, for example, which are just difficult to, to, to actually physically get there or to get permission to land there. And there are other places where there are licensing restrictions, places where there's difficult propagation. You know, some of the places in the Arctic, for example, um, constantly have, have a very rural propagation and it can just be very difficult to get a signal out. And then there are the places which are really expensive. A lot of the uh, the trips down to the Antarctic, for example, that involve hiring icebreakers and helicopters. Um, you're talking probably million dollar trips at that point. And, um, you know, that, that's why those places get rare. So there can be a whole variety of reasons. I haven't even mentioned um, uh, places like Scarborough Reef, where it is a tiny, tiny little um, rocks um, sticking out of the ocean that you have to kind of build a platform around uh, in order to, to have enough space to even operate. So uh, when, when we're choosing a place to go to, we kind of start off with the most wanted list. So the most wanted list for anyone who doesn't know is published on the Club Log's website uh, on a regular basis, um, clublog.org. You don't even have to have an account on Club Log to go and see the most wanted list. And it is literally just a, uh, an analysis of everyone's logs that have uploaded to Club Log and find the rarest places, the, the, order, the ordering of the countries that are the least spoken to. And so you start going down the, the most wanted list, asking questions like, how do I get there? Where can I stay? How much radio equipment would I need to take? How do I get a license? Um, are there any customs restrictions? So uh, on, on licensing uh, in particular, you tend to end up with, there are kind of three cases. 
there's the really easy case, which is the CEPT case. So our, our UK advanced licenses are CEPT licenses. Um, so anywhere that is a CEPT signatory, not just Europe, you know, places like uh, places like Peru are now CEPT license license countries. Uh, you can just go and operate uh, with no restrictions. There is a number of places in particularly South America and the Caribbean, which do not participate in CEPT, but where there is, um, it used to be the case at least, that uh, you could go in and operate very easily under the US reciprocal agreement if you had an American call sign. Um, now I do, I do have an American extra class call sign partly for this reason and partly just because actually the American extra exam is, is really interesting and I'd uh, strongly recommend anyone to do it. But um, the license, um, that, that is a less of an easy thing to do now. A lot of the countries around that area have got used to the idea um, that foreigners were getting American call signs in order to go and operate uh, from these countries. And so they now have added the restriction that you have to go into the country on an American passport, as well as having an American license in order to operate. So that, that American case is, is less useful than it used to be. And then there's the cases where there's kind of ad hoc um, reciprocal agreements. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those when, when we come on to talk about the, the, the expeditions in more detail. Customs restrictions, those tend to apply, um, particularly in some of the African countries. I haven't ever operated from anywhere like that, um, but basically you have to go in with a carne, so a, a full list of all of the equipment you're taking in, all the serial numbers and everything, and it gets checked off and then checked back out again. So uh, obviously got time and, uh, and potential issues with bureaucracy there. So you kind of start working down the most wanted list, as I say, and you fairly quickly cross off all the things at the top, you know, North Korea. Yes, you can get there at a push. Um, you're not going to get a license. Bouvet Island is a Norwegian polar territory in the Antarctic. Um, you're going to be talking upwards of, of course, a million dollars in order to get the icebreaker and, and um, things like that in order to go there. Um, Scarborough Reef, I've mentioned, which requires the, the ridiculous platforms because they're just a few um, a few um, rocks in the I in the in the ocean in the South China Sea. You've got Peter the First Island there at position number nine. Uh, that again is going to require icebreakers and helicopters and medics and the like. Um, you may recall there was actually the expedition there uh, just a few years ago. And then you've got other obscure cases like in position 19 on this list, Mount Athos. Now, Mount Athos is in Greece. Uh, you see the Sierra Victor prefix there. Um, on the face of it, it should be very easy, right? Uh, except the only way you can get a license is to be a monk in the monastery there. Um, and uh, unless you feel like uh, adopting a career as a monk, um, you're, you're not going to get a license. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the resident monk who was licensed there um, recently passed away. So that one is going to increase in its rarity now, I suspect. So you've got all these cases, and as I say, you, you fairly quickly cross off everything at the top of the list unless you're uh, a really serious expeditioner. But by the time you start to come down, sort of the, um, about a third of the way down the list, you start to get to places which you kind of go, hmm, yes, that might just about be possible. So UK bases on Cyprus, for example, how do you get there? Um, well, obviously, it's very easy to get to Cyprus um, under normal circumstances, lots of tourist flights. Where can I stay? Again, not a problem. Lots of lots of tourist hotels in Cyprus and, and the like. How do you get a license was a bit more problematic for this one. And uh, we'll come back to that later. Other cases like San Pierre Miquelon. How do you get there? Well, that's a bit more tricky. Uh, it involves a flight to, um, to Halifax, Nova Scotia. That only exists um, for a couple of months a year, uh, that flight direct from England. So have to, that's going to limit when you can go. You're going to have to get through ca Canadian immigration and then get a flight back out to San Pierre Miquelon and then, uh, and then enter France that way. So that's a little more, little more tricky to, to, from a logistics point of view. Where can I stay? That used to be a really easy question on San Pierre Miquelon. Um, it used to be the case that there was a motel um, which was very friendly to radio amateurs and which had a store of amateur radio gear in the hotel. Uh, so that meant that you didn't have to take much equipment either. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, no longer a possibility. So uh, the last time I went to San Pierre Miquelon, um, we ended up um, finding a um, basically a dormitory that's used by schools, uh, school trips. And um, that was that was where we stayed. But that then meant we did have to take all the equipment with us. 
licensing is obviously easy it's france it's cpt uh, although be aware that some of the french territories do not uh, are not under cpt so you just have to check that one and european union uh, no customs restrictions at least uh, back at that time and then a sanction island again how do you get there we'll we'll come back to later so you, you can kind of see that there, there's you start to get as you go down the most wanted list um some some possible op opportunities that you can start um, start looking into and one of the things i really enjoy actually about the expeditioning is is the logistics and the planning side of it um and and trying to trying to work out how these things might work so let me take you into a little bit more detail about a couple of trips to, to give you a bit more flavor uh, first one I'm going to talk about is ZD8UW, a sanction island. So we were there in uh, 2013. Um, what can I say? Really, really weird place. Um, Terry was actually on this trip, so uh, he, he may uh, um, butt in a, a little later with, with some of his thoughts. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very obscure place. Um, I'd kind of describe it as white hall in the mid-Atlantic. Um, it's uh, th the main things on the island are the RAF base, which is actually rented from the US Air Force. Come back to that in a moment. Uh, the Met Office, the European Space Agency, allegedly GCHQ, and um, another big uh, company that we'll, uh, I'll show you a little later on as well. So that's a kind of a sanction island, a very, very obscure place. And as you can see, it's driving on, on the left in this photo. Um, so uh, we're, we're definitely a British territory. How do you get there? Um, what I'm about to say is um, is no longer applicable. Um, at the time in 2013, you hitched a lift with the RAF. Uh, I'm not joking. Uh, you went to RAF Bryce Norton and um, the RAF at that time were using a sanction island as a refueling stop on the way down to the Falkland Islands. So um, the RAF very bizarrely run their own travel agency. So you could actually book a ticket with the RAF and uh, each of these flights had about six, uh, uh, six to eight seats uh, free on every flight for that were available for civilians um, for other purposes. So um, it wasn't cheap, uh, sort of up, upwards of a thousand pounds, but you can just could just book a ticket with the RAF and, uh, and hitch a lift on this on this flight down to the Falklands and, uh, and get off on a sanction. Um, that has some interesting consequences. You kind of didn't, um, obviously, if, if anything blew up in the, not literally, I hope, but if anything happened in the Falkland Islands, um, the military top brass might have wanted uh, access to the flight. You'd have been kicked off. So until you're actually sitting in your seat, you didn't know that you were necessarily getting on the flight. And uh, this, uh, this leads to all sorts of interesting logistics uh, things in terms of uh, if any given individual couldn't have gone at the last minute, um, we needed to make sure, for example, that they didn't have all of the coax, uh, because obviously that would have uh, rather upset the trip. So a uh, matter of making sure the equipment was uh, was well partitioned between us. Um, and um, so, but yes, I mean, it was it was at that time very possible to get to a sanction. Uh, I say that no longer applies. And the reason why is that um, since that trip, the runway has developed a pothole. And uh, you wouldn't think that this was a big deal necessarily, but as I say, it's um, it's a U.S. Air Force base that the RAF were renting back from the U.S. Air Force. Uh, there's a, a complicated story around World, World War II in, in, as to why that situation happened. But anyway, um, the RAF and the U.S. Air Force spent several years sort of pointing fingers at each other, um, trying to work out who was responsible for fixing the pothole. Uh, they eventually started work on a runway upgrade February last year. And they're saying it's going to be two years work in order to fix the runway. Uh, so that's currently closed. And uh, the uh, as a result, the refueling stop at the moment is going through Cape Verde. Uh, so not stopping on a sanction island at the moment. If you do want to get to a sanction island, you still can. Um, the uh, the route is you fl would fly to Cape Town, then fly to St. Helena and then fly to Ascension. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a three hop and very long way round going via Cape Town. Um, so there, there was someone actually there uh, within the last couple of weeks operating from there, but uh, that one is, uh, is certainly becoming a bit rarer now. Hopefully once the runway is fixed, uh, the RAF will start going back there again. In terms of where you stay on, on Ascension, and again, this is uh, quite no longer quite the case. Um, we stayed in this place, this is called Green Mountain. Um, as you might expect, sort of a mainly desert island near the equator, 
Uh, Green Mountain is, is your sort of lush volcanic middle of the island. And uh, most people don't come up here. Uh, most people sort of stay in, stay in the towns around the coast. But uh, this, this cottage on Green Mountain was owned by the local hotel chain and uh, was really well known among amateur radio the expeditioners because it's just a fantastic place as they owned by a hotel chain with this fantastic sea pass takeoff uh, towards both uh, uh, Europe and North America. Um, we understand at the moment because of the lack of tourists, because of what's happened with the runway, uh, this place has basically fallen into disrepair and uh, hasn't had any habitation. To, uh, obviously with a tropical wet climate, um, it has, uh, has not fared very well. So um, uh, no one's been staying on Green Mountain recently. But anyway, uh, that is the takeoff from our six metre uh, quad looking towards Europe, a wonderful sea pass. And we did, did manage to make some, some QSOs sort of into, uh, into south of Spain and uh, Charlie Tango uh, using that six metre quad, um, even though that, that's seriously quite a long path from the, from the equator. So we obviously had to take all the gear with us, um, which was fine. We, we took a few, a couple, um, I think it was three stations in the end on that one. How do you get a license? Well, this is how you get a license. Uh, a little bit in advance of the trip, you send a photocopy of your passport and your UK licenses to the uh, Sanction Island government. Uh, you don't hear anything back and everything goes very quiet. You kind of get on the plane a a anyway, hoping everything will sort itself out. Um, despite the fact you've got, you kind of got, get an email saying you've got a license, but that's, that's it. You stop in, in the parliament, stop off at the parliament building, having got off the flight and uh, they present you these uh, pieces of A4 paper, um, which are your licenses. So uh, you'll see Terry there in, in the middle and uh, um, that, that was the five of us that went on that trip at the um, at the Parliament House. I mentioned there was another uh, institution on Ascension Island, and uh, this is it. This is a telephoto uh, lens photograph from Green Mountain. So these were kind of our neighbours on the coast. Uh, this is the BBC World Services Atlantic Relay Station. Uh, looking at, um, so, if you listen to the BBC World Service on shortwave in West Africa you're almost certainly getting it from here. Um, and this is putting out serious amounts of kilowatts, as you might imagine, um, really serious. You know, they, they have their own electricity supply, uh, own electricity generator plants and everything, um, and these big curtain antennas. Um, we amazingly did not get that much QRM. Um, if memory serves, when we were on 30 meters and they started up on their, uh 31 meter band so um about 9 9.6 megahertz or thereabouts when they started up on that sort of frequency i think we were aware of it um but generally not too many problems at all um despite what we feared and they were very very friendly and actually let us have a tour of the uh, of the site um so uh, that if I, th I think that's that was an antenna tuning unit if i'm right at least you've got the uh, the very big coil and the um and the arm um that, that uh, does the does the match on on the massive um tuning unit so this is seriously industrial scale um terry i'm sure will correct me if i ever got that wrong so uh that's uh that was one of our trips um uh down to uh down to sanction island um just as another example sort of a very different type of trip that we went on uh as say end of uh, 2018 um, three of us went down to Montserrat in the Caribbean and you know this looks like this lovely lush uh, Caribbean island um, very very lucky to be able to go there um, well that's what the north of the island looks like the south of the island um, looks um, a little bit less impressive uh, so you may remember uh, if your memory of the news is good that in 1997 uh, there was a volcanic eruption on Montserrat which uh, basically covered the entire south of the island, destroyed the entire south of the island, which is kind of why Montserrat's fallen off, off the Caribbean tourist trails these days. Um, this is actually a photo of Plymouth, the capital city of Montserrat. It is the world's only capital city with a population of zero because the place was evacuated and they haven't yet built the new capital city. So um, that's an in interesting little fact for you. Uh, and uh, the other thing to point out in this photograph is we're actually looking at the fourth and fifth 
floors of these buildings. Uh, there are three floors of the buildings buried in the ash um, underneath where underneath our feet. So a very, very eerie place. And we had to get a police escort to uh, to actually go into this uh, southern exclusion zone on, on Montserrat um, because it's um, it's still got an active volcano there. Um, you know, there's very strict rules about not being able to be too far from the car. Car's engine had to be left running at all times and we were constant radio contact with the volcano observatory. Um, so a very, very weird place to go to. And, and this, as I say, is, is what I really love about the expeditioning is the opportunity to go to places like this, which um, most tourists would, would definitely not go anywhere near. Now, one of the impacts of the volcano eruption on Montserrat is that um, there is no big international airport anymore. The, the runway at the airport were all, are also destroyed. They're also in this exclusion zone, which you're not allowed to go into. So um, how do you go to Montserrat? Well, fortunately, it's Caribbean. It's not too difficult. You, uh, you fly to Antigua, um, which is regularly serviced from London. And then you've kind of got two choices. You can either get uh, an internal flight to uh, the small landing strip on Montserrat um, from Antigua, or alternatively, you get the ferry. Uh, now, the, the choice there for us was really around weight limits. The, the little plane that does the hop between Antigua and Montserrat um, doesn't allow you to take any luggage of any significant weight. We had amplifiers. We had um, big, um, big amounts of equipment. So, you know, it was it was definitely going to have to be ferry. And then you come into some more logistics problems because the ferries don't run every day. That doesn't necessarily match up with when the flights into Antigua come in. And um, Antigua has a fairly hefty arrival duty um, as a tourist tax uh, if you land on Antigua and you stay overnight. So you really want to get off Antigua within, um, within the day if you can. So uh, that kind of... Um, set out when we had to go. So end up landing on Tiga, getting a taxi across the island and then getting the ferry to Montserrat. And, uh, and the photo you've got here through a rather dirty uh, ferry window uh, is the uh, view of Montserrat from the ferry. In terms of um, where you stay, this is really easy. This is what's lovely about, uh, about this place. Um, this is a place called Gingerbread Hill. It is, well, it's kind of, um, it's run by a, a family and it is kind of marketed as, as two different studio apartments, the, the, the ground floor and the, and the first floor there as two different studio apartments and available as a sort of um, honeymoon accommodation uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, you'll notice that uh, a, a very kind American station has um, left a Versa Tower and a Yagi uh, attached to this uh, this beautiful uh, idyllic place, and and so they do market themselves to amateur radio as well. And if you go onto their booking their website, uh, you see in fact there's even a page called CQ 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 uh, with a video tour of all the equipment and things that are, that are left there. Um, as I say it's an American station who who just left a whole load of gear there that's available. Um, you just ask email him ask for permission to use to use the gear that's there, and. Um, Absolutely brilliant. If you go there for amateur radio, they do ask you to to fork out to buy uh, to, to rent both of the apartments, uh, both the ground floor and, and the upper floor, which is fair enough because uh, us radio hams tend to keep very strange hours and make a lot of noise and go clambering around things. So uh, it's uh, it's reasonable they don't want any or they don't want to uh, have honeymooners there at the same time. So uh, that's um that's the gingerbread hill very makes it very very easy you don't need to take that much um equipment if you don't want to um and they even sort out licenses for you uh, so the the owners here are friends of the i'll, I'll call it the licensing authority it's a little bit grand grand, grand. apparently it is um a, a lady that pops in uh half a day a week to an office that's above the local supermarket um and they issue the licenses. They they sort it all out with Gingerbread Hill directly, and then um, when you when you arrive, the licenses are ready and waiting for you at the accommodation, which is absolutely fantastic. And the most brilliant thing about this place is the takeoff. So um, we did the obvious thing and uh, strapped a video camera to the uh, to the antenna and swung the rotator around, so I can actually show you what it looks like. So you've got this wonderful takeoff towards JA and the East of Asia. 
a little bit more difficult um, this area, but going towards London, you've got the little gap between the hills there towards London, which makes uh, West Europe easy. Going out towards Africa, that's going to be hidden by the hill behind you, though not very many QSOs uh, towards South Africa and then the tip of Brazil. But, um, but you know, by the time you get round to, to Chile and uh, up across um, the north of South America, uh, VKZL, and then all the way up through uh, um, Central America, through Mexico, that's all CPATH, and then all of the USA is available as CPATH from, from the accommodation. So absolutely brilliant takeoff. Um, Western Europe, a little bit more tricky, um, but uh, you know the pileups from, from North America were just absolutely amazing. So that's kind of a very different trip, as you see the, the different levels of organization that are required in, in different different ways between uh, between uh, Montserrat and uh, and the Sanction Island. And then as another example of a very different trip, um, very quickly, uh, our most recent trip, uh, January last year to ZC4UW, uh, the UK sovereign base area in Cyprus. Now, for anyone who isn't aware of what on earth this is, the UK has two RAF bases, which are uh, part of Cyprus, or that they are on the island of Cyprus, but they are technically UK territories. So there's uh, um, Aquateria and Daclia. Um, and this one was really difficult to get permission. Um, you know, you're talking about a military base. The permission had to come um, through through the army and through the RAF. And um, you know, it was it was difficult to get permission. It required local contacts. It took um, two years of negotiation to get the license for this one. So a lot more tricky. And, um, and it was obvious that you had to be a UK passport holder to even stand a chance of, of getting the license here. Um, I'm even not allowed to say exactly where we operated from, um, but we were within the sovereign base area. And this, um, could probably work it out if you tried from from the photograph which is the photograph on the qsl card uh, so trivial and very cheap physically to get to but massively wanted uh, as as a dxcc entity just because the licensing is is quite difficult so as you see type of run here um, vertical antennas vertical antennas next to salt water is all you need there's absolutely no point taking large amounts of metal work on this sort of the expedition. Um, they, uh, fiberglass poles and bits of wire are fine and uh, into the salt water is absolutely brilliant. No problems at all. Uh, only problem in fact was uh, the, the tide kept on washing away the radials. We had uh, some fairly significant storms most evenings and, uh, and uh, had to go and fix the antennas quite a bit most mornings. But uh, apart from that, was, that's all you need. Um, don't think, however, that these trips are always luxurious and uh, always uh, wonderful sort of Caribbean hospitality. The case of this trip, what I can say about where we were operating from is it was a restaurant. It was a restaurant that was closed for the winter season, which is why we had to go there in January. And um, this is a very cold looking uh, Michael G7VJR. The place wasn't heated at all. Um, it's as you see, it's it's kind of although it's a it's, it's a restaurant and close to the winter season, they kind of don't do any clearing up at the end of the season. They wait to do all the cleaning and everything like that in at the beginning of March. And that we understand is per past partially to keep the um uh keep any any robbers and things at bay. So the place was an absolute mess. You can see all the condiments and everything just left out on the tables there, table stacked up behind us. And um, as you might imagine, it, it did have a certain smell to it, but also every single surface was uh, was covered in uh, in cockroach poison. Um, so uh, you had to be very, very careful about uh, what you touched them and eating with your hands and things. So uh, not wonderfully comfortable, but a, a brilliant place uh, to operate from. And as I say, you know, massively wanted and uh, massive thanks to the people who uh, who allowed us to operate from there as well. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the uh, the slightly less comfortable end of of things, and it leaked as well. As I say, we had some storms. You try your best on these get the expeditions, but you always get the complaints. Um, here, obviously, fake call signs, um, but 
the, the message is very clear coming through on the cluster. And we, we kind of do try and watch the cluster where we can. Um, Anti-North America, no routine for the USA, QRT, etc. We'll just point out these spots are at midnight UTC, which is two o'clock in the morning there. Um, so it's already, you know, we would have had to be awake quite quite early in the morning to, to operate that path. But that's fine. We, we were willing to do that. The problem we had was we had these storms every night and you know, massive, very local lightning strikes, as in very, very close on the beach. Uh, so everything had to be disconnected overnight. So, um, yeah, you try your best. There's always going to be complaints. You kind of deal with it. The other thing that um, we've taken the decision in the last couple of expeditions we've done is not to run any FT8. Um, see the spot here. Thanks, no beep FT8. Um, don't have anything against FT8 particularly. Um, it's, it's fine as a mode, but there's, there's a couple things here. First of all, a number of us on these trips are working software and we literally spend our days clicking mouse on screen and no, we've we spent a lot of money to go to these trips and it's not particularly exciting for us necessarily to just click a screen. But also it's very disappointing when there's really obviously good propagation um, that could support voice uh, or CWQSOs and everyone is just doing FT8. So um, we feel there's a risk that people won't bother with SSB and, and CW on the expeditions if, uh, if we kind of don't, don't make a point of doing it. Uh, so we're, we're keen to try and encourage some activity on some of the other modes. Uh, but obviously, that's, I'm very much aware that's a, a bit of a controversial opinion. In terms of the um, the radios we use and the equipment we use on these trips, um, this is a very typical setup. Um, this is again uh, um, the the Montserrat station. Typically, um, a, a laptop running DXLog. You want to run a, a decent uh, contest grade logging software optimized for very fast log entry. You know, if you're working a pile up of four or five, maybe even six QSOs a minute, you want to be able to get the call signs in the log very quickly because uh, to get as many people as possible in the log. So um, decent contest logger. Elecraft K3 is kind of our, our standardized rig in, in our group. Um, you basically, you want a decent rig with really good receiver and really clean transmitter. You've got multi-operator, multi multi-band setup many rigs on the same band and uh, if you if you don't have good meters uh, you'll just qrm all your own other stations and make make life life difficult um, we do run band pass filters um, which are actually partially useful as tokens so you can only be on 20 meters if you have the 20 meter band pass filter and that stops uh, any accidents or it helps stop any accidents but Actually, the, the K3s are clean enough that um, on the occasion where we've had individual filters break, um, we've managed to operate. Uh, and unless you're on the exact harmonic of one of the other bands, you can generally operate fine. So uh, decent quality rigs. And um, you've got the PowerWorks um, uh, switch mode power supply there. Just mentioning that one because it's got um, power poles on the front of it as the connectors. Absolutely brilliant things for, for the expeditions, um, nice and robust. And then you've got, in this case, the Juma uh, kilowatt uh, P, uh, linear. Uh, we also use the Elecraft KPA 500 a lot as well. Reason I'm mentioning amps is you want to be loud. Um, being loud as a DX station helps control your pileup. It's really, really critical. As soon as you are a weak station, You'll get people who don't, who can't hear you. There'll be, excuse me, there'll be some QSB. They will be trying to trying to call you, and they will really, really. Um, th there'll be somebody who doesn't hear you. Who'll call a bit too long. You, the person you're trying to talk to, then won't hear you, and your pileup will very, very quickly um, lose control, and uh, and you'll just get chaos. So you really want to be as loud as possible. Um, obviously obeying local power limits. Uh, and VP9 was interesting because we could only have 100 watts. Uh, so be as loud as possible, decent rigs, bandpass filters, and you should be fine. Expect something to break. Uh, there's a couple of reasons I say this. First of all, if something does break, um, and if you've gone into the expedition assuming things are going to break, then it's, it's sort of less disheartening to yourself. 
but also be realistic. You are running these rigs and these amplifiers really hard. If you're running pileups for 15, maybe 20 hours a day, um, probably in a hot atmosphere, quite possibly in a salty atmosphere, quite possibly with a imperfect um, voltage supply, the voltage going up and down, probably changing frequency a bit and all sorts, you're going to be really taxing the equipment you've taken. So just go into the expedition assuming something is going to break. If it doesn't, bonus, but um, you, you'll it'll help with your packing, uh, help you work out what you need to take spares of. And um, yeah, also on packing, you can never have too much coax, but that's uh, aside. I mentioned being loud to ensure that you are heard. Um, the other aspect here in terms of operation is split operation. Um, always, if you're de-expedition, operate split. It's fantastic. So split operation, just in case anyone isn't aware, is when you're transmitting on one frequency and you're receiving on a slightly different frequency. There's a couple of reasons for doing this. First of all, it again helps ensure you are heard. If that station that's calling you goes on calling a bit too long, then um, they are, it's not gonna affect anyone else trying to listen to, you, listen to you because they're still gonna be able to hear you on your own transmit frequency. So it helps to ensure you're heard. The, um, yeah, the, the, the other thing I'd say about split operation is don't leave it too late. Uh, it's very easy to think, get to a de-expedition first time you call CQ, very few people come back to you first time and you'll be running sort of very, very gently and leisurely initially. And then somebody will spot you on the cluster and you'll suddenly get all hell breaks loose. Um, if you leave it to that point before you go split, uh, and believe me, I've learned this through hard experience, um, you will have already lost control of your pileup at that point because they won't know it's your first pileup. So um, even if it feels like it's not really worth it, I, I would always recommend go split early and then when that first spot appears and all the world suddenly lands on top of you, um, you'll be ready for it. Get the pile up to spread out. Um, the other reason for operating split is not only so that you can ensure you are heard, but also to help you distinguish call signs in the, in the mess that's calling you. So this is particularly true on CW. If, you are, if I'm say on 14.020 listening up one, if everyone who is calling me all calls on exactly 14021, I'm not going to hear anything. I'm just going to hear basically a solid tone. So get the pile up to spread out a bit. Not, I will typically just say up, um, be, be slightly more vague. As, and, and then as an operator, your job is to make sure you don't always listen on the same frequency. I tend to scan around, sort of go, go between two frequencies, go up and then come back down again, go up and come back down again. The really experienced operators will detect what you're doing and make sure they're jumping just ahead of where you're going to land next. Um, but it just um, it just really helps to encourage everyone to spread out. Uh, I particularly have a, have a rule which, if somebody spots me with a QSX frequency on the cluster, I make a point of not using that QSX frequency. Again, it just helps to to make sure everyone that doesn't land exactly on top of each other. If you're operating split, give your call sign regularly and say that you're listening split. The last thing you want, um, first of all, the last thing you want to be gone to the trouble of operating split is somebody not realizing your split and calling on your transmit frequency anyway, because um, that then kind of defeated the object. Um, or somebody just jumping on top of you and saying, what's your call? Who is this? Um, so make sure you give your call sign regularly, say you're listening split and you'll be fine. The other thing um, I mentioned that if you're if you're on voice, if you're calling CQ, you kind of get a little bit of a run up generally. So you'll land on frequency beginning of the day, beginning of the expedition, call CQ and you'll get one or two stations come back to you. And maybe you have have time for a little bit of chat with them before your first spot on CW and, and also for that matter on Ruti, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the reverse beacon network, as as you may know, is a global network of SDRs that are continuously decoding all of the CW and all of the RUTI on all of the bands simultaneously and reporting those onto a cluster. What that means is that as soon as you put out that first CW CQ call, you will get your pile up. Um, 
this is quite exciting, but it also means that uh, if you've, um, say, just come off a flight, you're a bit exhausted, you've just spent a couple hours putting up antennas, and you go in, you need to be ready for that pileup. Um, now, just to give you a little bit of flavour, this is a, a very, very short audio clip I'm, I'm about to send you. Um, this is just a little flavour of what um, one of the pileups sounded like when we were in, um, in Montserrat a couple of years ago. Victor Papa 2, Mike Uniform Whiskey up 5. Oscar November 7, Alpha Hotel. Oscar November 7, Alpha Hotel 59. 70, Victor Papa 2, Mike Uniform Whiskey up 5. Florida 5, November Alpha Kilo 59. No, thanks for 5 and 9, sir. You are 5 and 9, thank you. Thank you, Victor Papa 2, Mike Uniform Whiskey up 5. So, as I say, that, that probably gives you just a little bit of a flavour, but um, imagine that going on for hour after hour after hour. Um, absolutely amazing. It's, it's exhilarating, don't get me wrong, but it is also quite exhausting as well. You, you don't go on these trips uh, to have, have a rest. Victor Papa. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, last thing before I, I hand over for some questions is to talk about the dreaded topic of QSLs. This photo you are looking at here is six weeks after we came back from ZC for UW last January. That is how many QSL cards we had already within six weeks had requests to apply to. So these are actively people asking us for their QSL cards. The only way to deal with this is, well, there's one of two ways, basically. Either you outsource it. You know, there are plenty of very kind people um, uh, amongst them, uh, Charles M0XO, for example, who, is, who are... Um, who are willing to take on being a QSL manager. If you if you want to ha have that opportunity, you know there are plenty of people who will do it, and um, go and do it. it. It's better that they do it than than you do a half job. Alternatively, if you want to do it yourself, and I I do do all of our expedition cards myself, um, just ensure you have a really efficient system. Uh, with this many cards to send out, you're not going to be handwriting them all. You're not going to be checking them all individually against a log. Um, the way we do it is we use Clublog OQRS. So this is um, on the we upload our logs to Clublog. Um, people can request the cards through Clublog. Again, they don't necessarily need a Clublog account to do that. And if they want a direct card, they they can um, also um, give a donation via PayPal. And that process automatically, as part of it, will do the check against the log and make sure it's a valid QSO that's being requested and that the time matches and everything. Um, and then in, in the case I've got, I've got an entirely automated system where it will um, every day download the latest request from Club Log and, uh, and marks it in my log for, um, for printing. So I just have to open up my log periodically, press the print button, and a load of labels come out of my printer. This is where we come on to the difficult question of bureau costs. And uh, I, I wrote actually something on my blog a couple of years ago about the actual costs of QSLing. Um, QSL cards can seem quite expensive if you get them from the expedition stations, but seriously, it is very rarely a money making exercise. If you take the envelopes in the all the crates at the bottom of that photo, each one of those had I paid proper stamp rates and actually I have the opportunity to use business class um, business postage these days but stamp price each of those would have a £1.45 stamp on it that's a lot of money already but then you've got the cost of the envelope you've got the cost of the printing of the card you've got the cost of the labels those are the ones that you're going to get money for you know the direct cards you can ask for money for the bureau requests all those brown envelopes at the top those are all cards which you're not being paid for effectively. So that's a lot of bits of paper. It's a lot of postage. Um, so when you're asking for money for the direct cards, remember that you've got the bureau cost you're not going to be getting otherwise. Um, otherwise, you'll end up seriously out of pocket. So, um, yeah, it's it's a seriously big job is, is QSLing. And um, this... Um, little bit of video um, gives you a, a little bit of flavour of the uh, of the little uh, assembly line that we had running amongst the operators from the ZC4 trip when we were doing all those all those cards last year. In fact, that's almost exactly a year ago. Um, 
so yes, please use OQRS. Please, um, we also upload all of our logs to Logbook of the World as well, which hopefully reduces some of the amounts of cards that we've got to got to send out. And the um, the last thing I'd mention, uh, if you have the opportunity to do it, um, we we always try to do live log uploads. So in other words, when you make a QSO with one of our expeditions, within typically thirty seconds or so that QSO will be on Logbook of the World and in Club Log. And there's a reason for doing that. And it, the main one is that it reduces duplicate QSOs. You've gone to these places for a potentially short period of time and you want to get as many people in the log as possible. And the last thing you want is somebody who is continuously making insurance QSOs because they weren't quite sure whether they worked you last time. The way you can get around that is if you're constantly uploading everything in real time to Club Log or to Logbook of the World, they can check as soon as they've had their QSO whether they're in the log. If they're not, then they can legitimately make another QSO and make sure they get that QSO. Uh, if they are in the log, they don't need to make another one. Uh, it's certainly something I'd recommend to any de-expedition. And uh, obviously, you might say, well, that relies on you having internet access. We've actually done this over, over Iridium satellite uh, modems. Not the most cheap way of doing it, but um, it again, it really helps to uh, to reduce the number of duplicate contacts. So that is it. I've talked probably for far too long, well, 48, 49 minutes. So I hope you enjoyed all of that. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions. Excellent. Excellent, Tom. Uh, right, well, we have one question already, but uh, before we go to Philip there, I have a question. Would you recommend every amateur, at least once, if possible, to go on a day expedition and experience it for themselves? Yeah, um, I, I, I can't see why I would answer no to that question. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the being at the end of a pileup, it, particularly if you're a day expeditioner, uh, sorry, if you're a DXer, if you are somebody who like sitting in your shack at home working the dx unless you have experienced what it is like to be that dx station and to hear the pile up from that end um i don't think you can really sympathize with what's going on so yes absolutely excellent okay uh philip you have your hand raised there if anyone else has any uh questions if you want to raise your hand or send me a message what have you if i can ask uh dom here but uh Thanks, go ahead, philip. Dom, i just <laughs> Seen a picture during your presentation of a broken uh, KPA 500. Uh, Dave and I both last at the same time. Did you really have to put the man's call sign on it? And, and tell us the story so we can slag him the next time we're talking about <laughs> it. Um, though, though some of you might be aware that, that call sign is um, um, the one and only uh, Steve, the general manager of the RSGB. <laughs> Um, so um, yes, it, that that's it, it's it's a bit of a, a Mickey take that uh, that um, uh, that photograph. Um, it wasn't actually a trip I was on. That is um, um, Rob's son, uh, Rob um, Terry's son, went on a trip uh, to I think that was in the Bahamas, if I remember rightly. Uh, that particular photo was taken, but the the message is is the same. You know, I think everyone has blown up an, a lamp at some point in um, in the course of one of these de expeditions. It happens. Um, so yeah, um, sorry to Steve, but um, but yes, it, it, it the, the point. Yeah, um, the, the point is it happens to everyone. Yeah, good laugh. Okay, anyone? Any other questions there? From the other end of the the X pileup one of the pile uppers if you like what would be from your end what would be the thing that you would suggest would make me stand out apart from massive power and whacking great big arrows would anything i say or the way that i operate uh, make any difference to you yes um be um make sure you're not on exactly the same transmit frequency as everyone else if you're slightly off to the side, even if it makes your voice that slightly bit higher pitched or slightly bit lower pitched, that's going to make you stand out. So sp spread out is definitely one thing. And the other thing is if the if the DX is doing that, um, doing a sort of sweep between two listening frequencies, try and work out what the pattern is. 
if if they are if they're sort of bet- if they're up three to five, up five to ten, whatever, work out how they are moving between five and ten. Are they going from five to ten, from five to ten, five ten? Are they doing five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, eight, seven, six, five? What's their pattern? Because as soon as you've done that, you can work out how to be one step ahead and where they're going to land next. And that's what the experienced Yexers do. And do you prefer the whole call sign given or the last three? I've heard whole call, both. Sign. Whole call sign. Yes, absolutely. Um, there. Um, first of all, it's it's uh, in fact, I'll say full call sign and once only um, a, 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 a Dexa who's who's running a, a pile up um, that's got a decent and it's got everyone spread out well shouldn't need to hear a repeat and it's just going to take more time if you have to go back to a partial call sign so you know it, it, the likelihood is if you send me your call sign i may well say alpha mech you, you say you said qi zero lam i might say send am question mark that's fine that's you um send, send me your call sign again if that happens but there's a chance i will hear the whole thing so it would be a waste of time if i you have to if i have to ask for a partial call sign all right, thank you very much. Good uh, lecture, by the way. Thank Brilliant. You. Great questions, great questions. Dom, where's next? So, and is there any, is there, sorry, I have two. Where's next and is there any that you really want to do that you haven't c- quite got um, there yet? Really want to do, yes, there's a few on the list. Um, I think St. Helena would be one of them, probably. Um, and there's, there's lots of places in the Caribbean I'd like to do as well. Um, I like warm places. Um, Svalbard was cold, <laughs> um, but very interesting, I have to say. Very, very interesting Svalbard, if you ever get the chance but to go. No chance when you come on the rare island, island, uh, a rare island of Ireland, though, if you like warm places. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've done done a few of the uh, of the uh, Echo Juliet Islands, certainly, um, in, in, over the years. Um, yeah. Um, in turn next, that's a really good question. Obviously, everything in terms of international travel is up in the air at the moment, um, or not up in the air. Um, it's yeah, um, a really good question. I suspect it'll be somewhere on the easier side of things because you know, if we we're not going to be putting together really complex plans and involve lots of logistics because the chance of you having to tear something up is going to be very high. So it's going to be somewhere that's very easy to get to, not particularly interesting probably, just to just to get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, you, oh. made, sorry Dave. you made a rather nice this, Dominic, but how often would you do your DX expedition? Um, how often? So, as I say, uh, we typically um, the, the Cam Hams trips happen once a year, and then so that, so that's the sort of the Hebrides, Isle of Man type ones, and then the the CWS trips where we go to somewhere slightly more interesting um, tend to do as once a year or once every eighteen months generally um depends on how, how things work out um i personally don't like going away in midsummer because everyone goes away in midsummer and i like to go away when it's cold in this country um so yeah um it, it depends on how it works out and a lot of the time the places like um zc4 you know we were dictated to when we could go because it depended on when the restaurant was closed for the winter so you know you kind of work within that uh, Don, we have a question here from uh, GI0AZA and GI0AZB, and uh, they ask, how do you pack equipment for an expedition? Is there particular cases for the job, or yes, who's your, who's your recommended cases? Who, who do you cases. personally prefer? Uh, so I, th- I think we, we've almost entirely all standardized now in, in our group on Pelly cases. Um, these are the ones that are used by sort of they are expensive you know you're, you're talking up with three figures for a case um, so you know it, it, they are expensive but they protect the gear really well they are used by sort of film crews and things you know the BBC Nature unit uses them to take all their camera equipment out um, to, to obscure places they you know they, they are really rugged you can basically drive a tank over the things um, so yeah great thank you Anyone else have any any questions there? Uh, from Terry, um, Dominic, that really took me back. That Ascension Island. Uh, uh, it's a few years ago. Yeah. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. 
Um, but I can, I can honestly say that if it hadn't been for Cam Hams and uh, CUWS, uh, I'd be very much a slack uh, rubbish, a shack sloth, and not enjoyed uh, the hobby anywhere near as much as I have. It's brilliant. And yes, the acceleration of, uh, of the pileup, uh, the um, lambasting you get when you're on your thirsty expedition, uh, because all of the other operators are saying, speed up, Terry, speed up, Terry. Come on, say it quick, quick, quick. Um, so I got my uh, collar felt many times, but it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Dominic. No worries, Terry. Uh, I've noticed a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, uh, how do you pick your team for the expedition? Group of friends. Um, yeah, generally group of friends. Um, I... I, I don't think we would sort of um, put out a call for people that you need to be in a group of people that you trust, you know, you're going to get on with, you know, you're going to be at each other's necks potentially for a week all together, crammed in the same room, all just sitting next to each other playing radio. If you're not going to get on, it's, it's going to be hell for everyone. So um, definitely, definitely will be, um, be fine. Find a group of friends first. There are the expeditions who, um, um, will occasionally put out calls for people on, on sort of reflectors and things. Um, so if you've never done the expedition before, keep an eye out. But I would, I would recommend first as a club um, getting together with people you know and, and going out. And I, there's another question there. Do you feel like roadies on tour when you turn up at an airport and you have all these pally cases? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. People's people's stern. You know, who, who's the band? Yeah. <laughs> you know. And that's actually a really good point. Actually, I, I should mention the amount of luggage you're taking is a really serious consideration. Um, you know, a, a group of us, and it may seem bizarre, but we tend to fly business class, and the reason is you get much larger luggage allowance. And the incremental cost of the luggage allowance versus having to pay for a business class ticket, often it's actually cheaper to get the business class ticket. So a um, uh, little tip, um, do, do look into that as, as an option. Um, it, it can be worthwhile if you've got serious amounts of gear. Um, and if you need to pay, you know, obviously keep, keep the equipment down, but accept that you're going to need to pay excess luggage. Uh, excellent advice. Uh, Lawrence asked me a question. Now that I've seen the talk, where would I like to go on a day expedition? Hmm, somewhere warm. Um, maybe the likes of uh, Gibraltar or Cyprus would be awesome. Um, again, handy because uh, you could be on UK territory, so uh, passports and all that. But yeah, that would be somewhere uh, nice that I'd like to go to. Cool. Um, Gibraltar is um, interesting from a licensing point of view. You basically can't get a license. Um, you can operate um, the local amateur radio. Club. I've not operated from there, but the local amateur radio club will um, are very welcoming, and you know you can operate their club station under the club call. Um, but it is not CEPT. Cyprus is nice and easy. Cyprus it is, and that was a quick decision. Okay, uh, George. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, I think, has got his hand up. Yes, yeah, me. Oh, um, sorry, yeah. yeah, I was just, this is obviously phenomenally expensive. So how do you get sponsorship, or are you all millionaires? Um, don't get sponsorship and not millionaires, no. Um there is a reason we don't go to the places at the top of the of the list of uh, the most wanted list you know th those are the ones where you do need to be millionaires and get lots of sponsorship um we've never seen the need to get sponsorship well actually there's one trip when we did and um but generally no it's it's just an expensive ho holiday and you kind of look at it like that we, we don't try and recoup any costs through the qsling qsling just about breaks even um it's it, it is what it is you know um but, you know, there, there are people who will, you know, I've, there, there are plenty of people who will pay like £2,000 for a holiday. And it's it's kind of that ballpark tends to be that sort of trip. So it's it's not insane, but, you know, obviously in a, in a fortunate position to be able to afford to do it. Thank you. Excellent. George, uh, GI4SAQ, you've got your hand raised. Go ahead. Thanks, Dave, and thank you, Dominic, uh, for the talk. Uh, excellent talk, and uh, nice to have worked you on a couple of occasions on those mm -hmm. day expeditions. I wonder, uh, especially on the uh, the winter ones, do you ever mix them with some of the big contests? 
that run through the winter? Um, and how do you find that swapping from de expedition mode to contest mode? Uh, tend not to is, is the answer. And the reason is, is generally that um, you know, pl- places like uh, Montserrat, places like um, San Pierre Miquelon, where you've got, um, or where you had in the case of San Pierre Miquelon, you've got um, basically rental shacks that are kind of available, got pits of the equipment there already. Those tend to be booked up well in advance for contests. It tends to be the people who've got the equipment there who, who tend to sort of book those out for themselves. So it tends not to be. And to be honest, I think um, you know, the, the expedition side of it is exhausting enough. I probably wouldn't want to do a week of the expedition and then do, let's say, a 48 hour contest. Uh, I think that, that would be that would be pushing it a bit much. So, um, no, tend, tend to keep the two things separate. I, I do enjoy contesting, but tend to do that from home. Um, uh, thank you, Dominic. Yeah, it's a lot more comfortable from home. Yeah. Uh, and it's nice to see you're using the same software as it uh, would be used in the contest as well. Uh, DX log yeah. and probably N1MM. Yeah. Okay, another question there that's come in. Uh, is there a register of possible contacts appertaining to different target sites? Like, do you just, out of the blue, contact uh, you know, local radio clubs to say you're going to be there or, you know, how does that even work? Okay, um, lots, lots of answers to that question. Actually, <laughs> uh, in um, th- there are websites um, uh, which deal with the licensing side of things. So there are directories for licensing. You can look up the, com- the, the country prefix, and it gives you all the details of which agreements they're in, things like that. In terms of making contacts with locals, um, a lot of it will be done um, sort of through friends of friends and things um but you can just write to write to radio clubs you know I, um when uh, a, f- a few years ago i, I had the, the fortune to go on a basically a road trip through chile um and as part of that i wrote to uh, i emailed a couple of, of the radio clubs and they kind of let me um join them for barbecues and things like that as i was passing through the area um you know, very, very pleasant. Got to meet some of the locals. Um, I, I, I dumped a, a battery on one of them because I couldn't take it on the plane. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's you can just, you know, eat, find find local radio clubs, do a bit of Googling around, basically. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, any last burning questions from anyone? Oh, sorry, I should just um, um, finish that answer by saying that in terms of rental shacks and things, um, Basically, that there are some places like Gingerbread Hill, like Ascension Island, Green Mountain, which are really well known amongst the de expeditioning community. So, find an expedition that's been there recently, drop them an email, say where did you operate from, and you can normally get contacts that way. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, uh, Eric, you've got the hand there. Go ahead. Hey, Don, thanks for the thanks for the bit of a talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just uh, you said there about Ascension Island. Is it a biggish place, or is it, I know you were only there briefly there, but um, no, it's it's tiny. Um, the size of an island, it is no. Um, I would have to look up the actual area of it. Um, it's it's basically got two very small villages. Um, is the best way of describing it. Um, uh, so uh, ninety one square kilometers apparently. Uh, so it's it's not. It's not small, but in terms of the well, in terms of the population, technically, it's um, it's zero because nobody's allowed to be born there. Uh, it's actually illegal to be born there. Um, your birth gets recorded on Saint Helena if you're born there. Um, apparently, the the actual approximately 800 residents, so big, a reasonably big island, but very very small in terms of population. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, Dom, uh, again, thank you so much uh, no for uh, having uh, come along even and giving us an, an, another uh, Tuesday night lecture series. It's been uh, great to have you along. And uh, you were obviously one of the first ones uh, that uh, kicked us off there. And uh, you're back again. So great stuff. Um, this will be appearing on our YouTube channel for anyone else to watch. Uh, again, youtube.com forward slash M U A R C media. And um, you can check out some of our club information as well at M U A R C.com. So, Dom, from us, thank you very much again. It's been great having you back. 
And uh, you never know. Maybe not the last time. We're not done with it yet. Uh, cool. But fantastic, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers.